In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives so that we can grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 verse 1. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And this might be a review for some of you, but we're going to come at it from a completely different angle. I'm going to teach it in much more detail, and we will move on from there. And one of the things that I found out about Matthew 24 and following is the fact that we're getting down to the brass tacks of what the Word of God has to say. Because uh, what we're about to do is move into a time called the Tribulation. And it's going to give specific directions to those people in the tribulation. And in one case, the Word of God will say, flee. In another case, the Word of God will say, fight. And you're going to have to know which dispensation you're in. You're going to have to know if you're in the first half of the, not us, but for those in the tribulation, they're going to have to know if they're in the first half of the tribulation or the last half. They're going to have to know all about the abomination of desolation. In other words, they're going to have to know doctrine. And for those believers in the tribulation who do not know doctrine, they will be slaughtered. They will die miserable deaths. Now today we live in the church age. And doctrine is no less important today. If anything, it's uh, just as important. And since we have so much more, it's more important. But what we see from the tribulational saints is the fact that they have nothing to do but follow the Word of God. Everything's going to be taken away from them and they're only going to be able to follow the Word of God. And the Word of God is always right. And there's going to be a lot of chances for those people in the tribulation to get emotional. And when our Lord says, flee, flee your homes, a lot of people are going to get emotional and say, no way. Kind of like when the hurricane's coming up through New Orleans. I'm not leaving. And look what happens when they don't leave. Well, the Word of God here specifically tells them when the abomination of desolation is created that they should leave their homes and flee the mountain. Flee to the mountains. Don't even bother going down and getting your clothes. If you're tending to your garden on your roof, take off running. And woe to you if you have children. And that's what it says about that. So it says, get going. Get moving. So the Word of God becomes very important to those in the tribulation just as it is very important for us today. But oftentimes emotions, this is the principle, emotions get in the way of our doctrinal perception. I see a lot of ladies shaking their head yes. <laughs> well, emotions. <laughs> emotions get in the way of our doctrinal perception. And uh, you ladies don't need to feel uh, inferior or anything like that. You're responders. You're made by God that way. And uh, you have a different area of uh, thing to work with than we do. But you are all you all start out equal, by the way. We all have equal privilege and equal opportunity to grow in grace and in knowledge. And that might be why women live longer than men. Equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the unique spiritual life. But if you run off your emotions, imagine you're in the tribulation, and we'll get into this deeper. I just thought I would uh, start off like this. 
And imagine you're in the tribulation and all of these uh, terrible things are about to happen and you've just settled into the most beautiful house you've ever had. There's a beautiful garden on the roof. Beautiful garden on the roof. That's the way they used to do it. We don't do that today. And you're up there uh, working in your garden on the roof and all of a sudden the abomination of desolation is er 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 uh, constructed, erected, and your husband runs upstairs and says, Hey, it's time to go to the mountains. Well, he knows some doctrine. And you say, I don't want to go to the mountains. I'm uh, planting my favorite squash. No, it's time to go to the mountains. The Bible says, Hey, it's time to go to the mountains. If you don't go to the mountains, we'll end up dead. And this will be a time when emotions are going to take over and a lot of Jews are going to end up dead because they got too emotional. They got too attached to where they were in their nice house with the roof, with the beautiful garden on it. And they said, I'm not leaving here for nothing. And so God killed them. Or actually God didn't kill them, but they did die to sin face to face with death. And so the Word of God is very, very important. It's brought out best of all right here in these passages uh, dealing with the tribulation because it's so intensified, it's this. Either you listen to the Word of God and follow the mandates of God or die. And that's your only choice. That's that one, or, one or the other. Now today you might think you have the luxury of I'll do this because my emotions, I feel this way, I'm going to go in this direction. Because my emotions say this, I feel like this, I'll do this. Well, you might have that luxury now, but uh, when we bring it down to brass tacks and we bring it down to the tribulation, uh, all of this is uh, condensed and intensified in which those who go for doctrine live and those who go against doctrine or reject doctrine or who get emotional die. Now, it's not so stark today, but really it is. It just uh, takes a little more time. In the tribulation, they got seven years to sort things out. For you, you might have 50, 60, 70, 80 years to sort out your life. Maybe 90 years. Some people even live to be 100 to sort things out. So it's over an extended time, and it, there's not a sense of urgency. But there should be. There should be a sense of urgency concerning the Word of God because if you don't learn the Word of God, you, you will be liable for the uh, sin unto death. The sin face to face with death. And it may not come tomorrow. It may not come seven years from now. But if you continuously go into emotional revolt, reject the Word of God, and reject it because you're arrogant, and you don't like certain things that come out of the Word of God, and you do that from now until you're 60, 70, 80 years old, you'll die the sin face to face with death as a 60, 70, 80 year old person, and it'll be just as bad as the person dying in the tribulation. Just as miserable. So this is a good time uh, right now before we begin this study of what's going to happen here, and uh, we'll be going into detail on this. It's a good time for me to bring out some passages that offend. Now, I'm just going to bring out uh, two of them. And they deal with ladies. And I don't do it because I hate ladies. I love ladies. And I don't do it because of uh, any type of male chauvinistic uh, type of personality. I do it because ladies are responders. And ladies have a tendency to respond heavily to emotion. And that has to do with anyone. Now, if it steps on your toes, so what? Take it as from the Word of God. And, uh, and when it comes to submission, you, you want to know what I did today? While I was on the computer, I simply typed in one word, submission. And uh, both uh, the, the two main passages that came out had to deal with women. Now, it's not. It's in the Bible, and I didn't type submission. I thought, well, maybe there'll be something here about a man needing to be submissive, and men need to be submissive to authority. They will be brutes in marriage if they're not submissive to authority. But women have trouble with authority uh, simply because, remember, we've studied this before, that uh, the woman always seeks Adam, and that doesn't mean sexually. She always seeks his authority. 
always seeks Adam's authority. So I simply typed in submissive into the computer, and these two verses came out. Now I tell you this because uh, we're about to deal with other verses. These verses won't be part of it, but I'm going to tell you these verses because uh, it's as if it's a matter of life and death, whether you know it or not. Whether you obey these passages, it's a matter of life and death. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. 1434, 1 Corinthians 1434. Remember, I just looked up the word submissive. So the only thing I was trying to do was to, well, you see, I'll tell you how exactly how it happened. I didn't even have ladies in mind. How it happened was I was reading this in uh, Matthew, and I knew it was dealing with the tribulation, and I said to myself, you know what? These people in the tribulation are going to have to be very submissive to the Word of God. And, there, and when the Word of God says, get up and move, they're going to have to get up and move. And whatever the Word of God instructs, they're going to have to do, no questions asked. And when the Word of God speaks, all human discussion ceases. So as soon as these events occur, up and out they go. And that's the way it should be, or they die. And then that brings into it the, how, uh, well, the importance of it all. So I said, they're going to have to be submissive. So I typed into the computer on the internet to, for, for the Bible to look it up, the word submissive. This one came up, 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Women should be silent during the church meetings. And uh, we don't have a problem with that most, most of the time here, so it's an, uh, nothing against you, so don't feel offended. Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is proper for them not to... It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive just as the law says. And that's 1 Corinthians 14, 34, the first submissive. And that means when women try to overthrow a church or try to speak or try to get a heavy hand in the church, it's not right. They are to be submissive. Then we have also... Titus. Now that one wasn't such a big deal. In fact, that wasn't a big deal much yet. That shouldn't have offended anybody because I, I rarely see anybody speak in this church whatsoever while I'm speaking. And if they do, I usually ignore it. But anyway, uh, we have Titus 2.4. Turn in your Bibles to Titus 2.4. And this is another word dealing with a submission. Now this is one of the most interesting of verses I have ever come across. I learned about it years ago and, and, to, and still today it is so interesting to me to note this. But it has to do with the makeup of the woman as a responder. The woman is a responder. And guess what? She's never commanded to love her husband. She's commanded to respect her husband. And that's interesting in itself. And of course, in a, a normal marital relationship, the wife will say, I love you. The husband will say, I love you. But uh, in fact, the wife is commanded to respect the husband. And from this verse indicates the wife, as a responder, has very... Uh, the only way she can understand true... The, under, uh, the only way she can love her husband is to get in contact with a woman who has the spiritual gift of loving a husband. One of the weirdest things I've ever seen, but it's right here. And we'll see it. Uh, Titus 2.4 And these older women doesn't mean they're old ladies walking around with canes and the, the, their uh, skin is about to fall off their face. Doesn't mean they're a hundred years old. It means older spiritually. These older women, older spiritually, they've been learning Bible doctrine. And they've been learning Bible doctrine, and because they've been learning Bible doctrine, they've reached spiritual self-esteem, so now their spiritual gift has come into focus. And they know how to use their spiritual gift. And it just so happens that their spiritual gift is to teach other ladies how to love not only their husbands, but their very own Children, Imagine that. It's in the Bible, so don't come up to me raising Cain. These older women must 
train older as in spiritually older, not older as in I'm 40, she's 60, she teaches me. No, the woman who's 60 may be an idiot, and the woman who's 40 may be spiritually mature. Older as in spiritual. These older women must train the younger women, the women who have not grown up yet spiritually. But we're talking about a church setting here in Titus. Titus is teaching whom? The Corinthians. He's teaching a bunch of uh, crazy people, really. But he's gotten them straightened out so good that he can teach them all the way down to this. And he tells them, these older women, these spiritually mature women, must train you younger women who are not yet spiritually mature to love their husbands and their children. In other words, it's actually they have the spiritual gift. And just from inference, if you just took inference from this verse, you would say that it is not natural for a woman to love her husband or her children. Yet uh, the opposite is true of uh, the opposite is what uh, mainstream thinks. Mainstream thinks uh, women obviously have a natural love for children and women obviously have a natural love for husband. It's not true. If it were true, this would not have arrived from the Bible. And I knew this might... Uh, and I, I bring this up because it's dealing with the Word of God, and it's one of those rarities of the Word of God, and I bring it up because it's so antithetical to what our culture says that I'm bringing it down to the brass tacks. Either you're going to accept the Word of God or you're going to reject it. Either you're going to accept it or reject it, and that's what they're going to have to do in the tri tribulation. If they reject it in the tribulation, they die. If they accept it in the tribulation, they live into the millennium. Now for us, I'm bringing it down to it. Are you going to believe this, uh, Titus 2.4? I didn't write it. I couldn't write it. There's no way I could even thought of this. I thought the exact opposite. For the longest time, I thought that the mother would have the natural love for the children. And our court system thinks that too. If... There's a divorce. More than likely, the children go to the mother. The Bible comes down on the the whole other side of it and says a woman's not even capable of loving children. Well, it doesn't say not even capable of loving children, but what it does say is they need some training in it. And that's odd. It doesn't say the husbands need training in it. And the husbands need no training in the love for wife. Why? Because we're commanded to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And that's something we can do from doctrine. And we don't need training from anybody. Never once are we... Uh, never once in the Bible is there any training of us to love our wives. It just comes by learning Bible doctrine. The more Bible doctrine we know, the more we will love our wives as Christ loved the church. And it's all, and then the woman, of course, in return, must respect the husband. But there's no command ever in the Bible to love. There's only this, only this verse. Out of the entire Bible, I want to make it clear, only this verse out of the entire Bible that talks about a woman loving her husband. And what it says is, these older women, spiritually mature women, must train the younger spiritually immature women to love their husbands. That's the first time ever the woman is... She still isn't even commanded to love the husband. This is just talking about a training situation in which the Corinthian church was growing in grace and in knowledge and there were some uh, women in the Corinthian church who had become humble enough and sub submissive enough to the Word of God that by their example... Now, this doesn't mean they were running up to, to uh, the uh, younger brides and saying, uh, uh, don't you uh, talk to your husband that way. No. It means that in social situations, uh, certain things would occur. They had been learning the Word of God. And women uh, mimic women. This is something we all know. In dress and in everything else. I mean, uh, just think about it. If you wear something and your husband says, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen, yet all the ladies say it's just beautiful then you think it's just beautiful. He's just a man. What does he know? So women mimic women. 
And so what happens in this situation is in the church of Corinthia, they're growing in grace and in knowledge. A lot of them are getting to spiritual maturity. And a lot of these women naturally looking at other women. And what they do is they look at how these other women treat their husbands. And they say, this woman treats her husband with the utmost of respect. And they observe it. And then when they're in conversation together, there's no gossip and maligning about the husband. There's just a... And and, and there might be a talk about marriage or something else. Women like to talk about relationships. And the subject might come up. And she might say, oh, I really respect my husband. Now, isn't that different than what we hear in the office place today? But we're talking about the Corinthian church that's growing in grace and in knowledge. Now in the office place today, the only thing we hear out of the mouths of women is, uh, my husband's an and so and so and so and so. Pray for me, my husband's an alcoholic. Pray for me, my husband's this and that and the other. My husband doesn't understand me, blah, blah, blah. And I worked in, an, in a field in which there were mostly women and all they did was talk about their husbands. That's all they did. The whole day long, it became a man-beating fest. And I laughed and went along with it because I knew what it was all about. And uh, But still, that's all it was. But as soon as the husband drove up in that uh, pickup truck, whoom, whoom, you should have seen them little women run. <laughs> I'm tell- no, I'm just saying. It's, it's funny to see because... Uh, they had just ripped them apart, and then they see their husband run out to him, give him a little kiss, you know. <laughs> anyway, but in the Corinthian church, this is what happened. And in the Corinthian church, the older women were living by Bible doctrine, and they were teaching the younger women who had not grown up spiritually yet how to uh, live in marriage, not, not because they were forcing it on them, because, you know, women watch each other. Women compare each other to each other. And so they started comparing one another to each other. And they looked at some of the more spiritually mature people in the congregation, and they said, well, they have a wonderful marriage. She respects her husband. And they would start to imitate and copy some of that. And that would have been part of their spiritual gift. And that's one of the most phenomenal uh, scriptures in the Bible, which means... Well, this is what it really means. If you go to a church where there's a a lot of uh, doctrinal teaching and there's men and women together, uh, it becomes the most uh, prime area for marriage. Good marriages, not bad marriages filled with bitterness. So then in Titus 2.5, what do these older women train them? Now, they're not necessarily holding a Bible class. If anything, they're not holding a Bible class whatsoever. They are, uh, they're, they're, just, they're just living by example. Titus 2.5, to live wisely and be pure. They compare themselves with these ladies and say these women are wise in doctrine and pure. To take care of their homes, to be good, that's good of intrinsic value, and to be submissive to their husbands. That's what the younger, uh, the spiritually younger women started to learn is that they needed to be uh, submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the Word of God. I didn't write this. If I wrote it... uh, I would have been stoned to death, probably. I didn't write it. This was written by the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, never married. And I wonder why. But we have here, then they will bring shame on the Word of God. In other words, if you do not obey your husband, if you do not become submissive to your husband, you bring shame upon the Word of God. Quote Apostle Paul, not quote Andy Lewis, and not run out. Andy said, I'll be ashamed of myself if I uh, don't do this and uh, make breakfast at 5 a.m. for my husband when he demands it. That's not what I said. So then in 24, verse 1. Now the reason I brought that up is simply because we're about to move into some tribulational passages. And in these passages... 
it's going to be very specific as to what the Jews need to do. And if they don't do it, they die. And if we don't listen to the Word of God, if we don't become positive to the Word of God, if we don't soak, uh, soak in the Word of God on a daily basis, we too will die the sin face to face with death. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe 30, 40 years from now, but it will be a miserable death. But everything is intensified in tribulation. So in 24.1, Now as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, we've studied this before and we'll go through these parts quickly, he was separating himself from religion. And then look at this. This is funny. Now as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, he was separating himself from religion. He was rather frustrated, by the way, and not to the point of sin, just righteous indignation. He just, uh, he, he wasn't irritated. That would be borderline sin, but he was just plain righteously indignant. And he's ready to leave these people. And then his disciples come up beside him, and they came up to do what? To show him the temple buildings. He had just come from the temple buildings. But now they're, they're, they're going up to Jesus. Hey, turn around. Look at the temples. Look at Herod's temple. Look how beautiful those structures are. And they were beautiful. And uh, Herod was a, a remarkable uh, engineer when it came to uh, constructing buildings. And the whole city was very, very beautiful. But our Lord had separated himself from it. And actually, uh, what we have here, uh, look at this. Now, as Jesus was going out, that's one of the temple courts, and walking away. If you were to write that in an English paper, they would say, hey, you're being redundant. He either, if he walked out, he walked out. Why do you have to say walking away at the same time? This, uh, remember, the Greek is very detailed in its language, and it means he walked out physically and separated himself mentally. And that's why it's used twice. 24.2 And he answered them, Stop looking at the buildings. I tell you the truth. Now, he's shouting this. I, I'm not going to shout it real loud. Some of you have sensitive hearing. But this is what he says. Stop looking at the buildings. I tell you the truth. Not one stone will be left here on another, and all will be torn down. Now, you have to understand there is a penalty for talking against the temple in Israel especially amongst the Jewish, uh, the religious crowd. If you talk against the temple, the penalty is death. And here is our Lord with the disciples, and they're all around Him. And there's probably a lot of other people around Him, and they do hear Him because they bring it up later in the trials. He says, uh, oh, this will all be knocked down under the fifth cycle is what He meant. And so the disciples by this time are scared they are scared because they had just admired the beauty of the buildings. Then our Lord said, these buildings will be torn down. And then, after that, they're worried that they're going to be arrested because that's a major crime, according to the Judaizers. So the disciples were enamored by buildings. And, and there's no doubt that the temple was beautiful. But the temple was not the issue, and the disciples were admiring something that was not uh, consequential whatsoever. The disciples had a tendency to be emotional. Any, everybody who starts out in the spiritual life in the beginning is emotional. When you don't have a lot to think about, you got a lot to emote about. And so you start out with a lot of emotions. And then eventually, when you grow in grace and in knowledge... You make sure that you subvert. You always have emotion. Don't ever walk away from here saying, that, that guy said I can never have emotion and I like emotion. I love emotion too. I'm not telling you you cannot have emotion. Your emotions, however, must always be subordinate to your thought. You know, when I have a good thought about our country, uh, sometimes a tear will well up in my eye. I won't let you see it. I'm not going to wear my emotions on my sleeve, uh, but uh, sometimes I'll start thinking about something wonderful and uh, I might shed a tear. And uh, uh, there's all types of ways to have emotion and to make sure it's in check with thought. 
but it's always in check with thought. And uh, sometimes you might think about all of the sacrifice our Lord Jesus Christ did on our behalf and just break down in tears. Well, that's a good emotion and it's not sin. But when the Word of God says, hey you, get up and leave Jerusalem, here's the abomination of desolation, and then you fall down and break out in tears, your emotion has overcome your thought and you're dead. Your emotions must always be subordinate to your thought. And that might seem like a boring life to you, but it's the most wonderful and stable life anyone could ever have is to have their emotions subordinate to their thought. And the only way to have thought is to learn the Word of God. So then in 24, verse 3, we move on to the Mount of Olives, and we're moving on to something that needs some definite a scriptural uh, delineation in terms of dispensations. I had a lot of questions concerning this uh, uh, when I taught it before on the internet concerning what do you mean 24-4 is a, a church age? I had always thought it is, this is a, a tribulation. Well, actually, we'll, we'll get to it and I'll explain it in detail. And I did a lot of study today on it uh, just to make sure I was on the right path because there were so many questions I started to wonder, am I wrong on this? So I had to go back and listen and look it up and look up at the certain scriptures and I listened to my own pastor and it's it's correct. So twenty four two. And he answered them, Stop looking at buildings, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another, and all will be torn down. Then in twenty four three, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when these things will happen. What things? What's he what are they asking about? Are they asking about the tribulation? No. They're asking about when, when's the temple going to be destroyed? You see, our Lord just said, now that temple's going to be destroyed and wiped out. And then they ask him, three, there's actually three different questions in this passage. The first question is, when shall these things be? And that question refers to what our Lord had just said regarding the temple. When shall the temple be destroyed? Not in the tribulation. So this isn't a tribulational passage right here. When will the temple be destroyed? The answer is obvious, uh, August of 70 A.D. And Jesus answers this question, but not in Matthew. He answers this question in Luke 21, 20 through 24. So if you want an answer to when will this be, well, he gives them an answer in Luke 21, 20 through 24. And what will be the sign of your coming? Now that's a whole different que that's a whole different question. First they ask about the temple. Now they're asking about the sign of his coming, which would be the second advent, and that is just totally different from the temple being destroyed. The temple's been destroyed now for over two thousand years. Now they're asking a question about something that's going to happen uh, indefinitely in the future. And that is 27 through 51, which deals with the second advent. What will be the signs of His coming? What will be the signs of the coming of Jesus Christ? The second advent. And the second advent, remember, is not the resurrection of the church. Don't get the second advent confused with the resurrection of the church. The resurrection of the church is not the second advent because He does not step foot on the earth. We meet the Lord in the air in the clouds. That's not the second advent. That's the resurrection. And if you get those confused, you would start to look for signs of the coming end of the age today, and there are none. That's all for the tribulation. And then uh, the third question, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the Jewish age? That's answered in 9 through 26. The end of the Jewish age is the tribulation. Now what shall be the sign of the, the sign of the end of the age is the tribulation. And signs of the tribulation are given beginning in verse 9. Not in verse 4. Not in verse 5. In verse 9. And we're going to see something that I learned just today. Fresh off my brain. 
And uh, it, all of this begins in verse 9. The tribulation, the actual signs of the tribulation begin in verse 9. The other signs deal with the things that go on in the church age. And actually, all through all dispensations, wars and rumors of wars, well, they've had wars of rumors of wars in the Old Testament. They'll have wars and rumors of wars in the church age. They will have wars and rumors of wars in the tribulation. It follows all through human history except to the millennium. Then there will be no wars and rumors of wars. But that is a trans-dispensational thing. And that's a, what we will see in the next hour is, is going to be a, a something that I didn't, I didn't clearly knew, know before. I knew it uh, academically, but I didn't clearly know it as I know it now. And it's going to be interesting to see. Then in 24.4, Jesus answered them, Make sure. Now, uh, well, let's just do this in the next hour because this begins 24-4. A lot of people think this is a tribulational passage. But this is actually, he's talking to the disciples. Remember, their first question was, when is the temple going to be destroyed? Remember that? And that's talking about uh, right then and there. And so our Lord here is talking about right then and there, and then later He moves on into the tribulation. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these uh, dispensations. And may we come to understand the importance of the Word of God and to follow the Word of God in that we must uh, be submissive to the Word of God, and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.